Welcome, I'm John Glanville, and this is video 50, part 3 in my Calmness in Mind series, where we explore common sense solutions for your karma life. Now, I've called this video Releasing Your Greatness by Consciously Hacking into Your Unconscious Brain to Test the Integrity of the Data It Uses to Make Decisions. Because if your anxiety stops you from driving your car or makes you repeatedly check things, or if you have to please everybody, um, if you're averse to risk, uh, if you can't touch anything red, if you, if you can't use a public toilet, or if you think you will harm or abuse another person, then just perhaps the unconscious data your brain currently uses to analyze your situation and to formulate your automatic responses might have been corrupted. And therefore, by repeatedly avoiding that which scares you and then running the same fearful stories, you'll be using a negative ERP, which reinforces those fears over the top of the corrupt or incorrect data that's already in your brain. And I think this is why without a sensible intervention program, people usually get stuck, uh, they worry more or they get worse. And sadly they squander potentially the best years of their lives going around in circles and pretending that everything is okay when obviously it's, it's not. So our new plan is to develop a strategy whereby we can isolate certain parts of the brain, uh, scrub that data, <laughs> reformat that area, and then reintroduce new data more aligned with the automatic responses we prefer our brain to give us in the future. Uh, and that's the goal of this video, to show you the what and the why of reprogramming yourself so then you can take this information and modify it to suit your specific issues and then do the work and then do the repetition to code these new responses back into the brain of the head, of the body, which is not you, because you are conscious awareness. You are the observer of what the brain and the body do. Now, as ever, I can't give you any proof that this is true, but it seems to be common sense true. And it's certainly what I found to be true for me. And you must find what's true for you uh, because we are all different, but there are many patterns and there are many similarities that we can call upon. So for this new form of positive ERP to work, I believe the first step is to deeply acknowledge, if you can, that 99% of all the things that happen to you are automatically done by the body and the brain. Um, they're unconscious, uh, they are automatic, and I think they're quite incredible. But they're not intellectual, but they are very functional. They just keep you alive. Uh, cell reproduction, digestion, breathing, uh, waste removal, temperature control, uh, reproduction, uh, keeping you safe and raising your natural immunity. They all happen automatically, silently, working together, keeping you as safe as best they can. I think if only you would get out their way and stop interfering. <laughs> The brain body just does what it was programmed to do with a bias towards keeping you alive and reproducing, but its logic is simplistic like an eight-year-old child. And all this happens unconsciously to you, not driven consciously by you. Um, even walking, talking, eating, typing, having sex, running, wiggling your fingers, you are not doing it. Now, certainly you may initialize it with a certain thought, you know, I will wiggle my fingers, but thereafter it just happens. Uh, uh, like me talking, it's just coming out of my mouth by itself. I think that if you sort of accidentally slip and then you recover your balance, or if while you're sleeping you, uh, you, 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 you roll over, you know, it feels like you were doing these things consciously, um, but you're not. These things are happening to you unconsciously, okay? Um, you get cleverly awoken from your slumber 
by your unconscious, which makes you move because the blood has stopped flowing to your left leg. So you need to roll over onto your right hand side to stop uh, tissue damage. But as you wake up, you get all grumpy and say, oh, why can't I sleep? Rather than saying, oh, <laughs> thank you, little body, for keeping me safe. And uh, I'm sorry that my fat legs cause all these circulation problems. Um, let me see if I can set myself some conscious intentions to lose weight or maybe to do more exercise. Uh, perhaps I could do some cold showers to increase the flexibility within my circulatory system as I wish to help you as much as you are non-judgmentally helping me even though I'm consciously so horrible to you. <laughs> Can you see what a different story this might be? Right? Our unconscious brain and our body, they're elegantly simple, okay? And they keep us alive and they urge us towards reproducing. And they try to second guess what will happen next so that we are prepared. And then it attempts to offer up ideas, um, proposals, concepts, thoughts for what it thinks might be an appropriate response for our well-being in that moment based upon all the information that was included in the programs that we were programmed by um, as we grew up. Your body will never judge you. It's here to serve you unconditionally. It operates automatically by the programs programmed into us from others and from how you have trained it via how you consciously talk to it each day. What your unconscious, what your body and your, 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 your brain hears the most, regardless of its truth, forms its unconscious belief systems, which, which once automated stop any evidence not in line with that belief from entering into the memory of the brain. And this is why there's no point reassuring an anxious person, because their belief system will just unconsciously reject and then forget whatever it is you tell them. And then it will still run the same belief system because it has no evidence to support it changing as it's already rejected all that information. Hope you can understand this because this is an elegant OCD loop trap. And this is why you can't tell a person, um, and this is why you can tell a person uh, you love them 10 times, or you can check the door is locked 10 times, but they still don't believe you because that data is not actually getting past the brain's belief system firewall and into the core of the brain to be registered. And therefore, it's only by breaking the belief system and gaining new real world experiences that those old belief systems might be changed, well, might be challenged and then changed. Do you remember when we were children and we played that game where you had to find something hidden and all the other children would say, oh, you're getting warmer or you're getting colder, depending on whether you were getting closer or whether you was moving the wrong way. Well, our automatic meat suit here, our body and our brain, they communicate with us by making us feel pain biologically, mentally and emotionally when we're going in the wrong way in life or if we are misunderstanding the basics of what they need. It's screaming colder, 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 but it does it biologically and unconsciously by scaring us with our conscious worst fears to get our attention. And then if we're getting it right, it rewards us with deep pleasure so we know we're on the right path for both what it needs as our service provider and what we need as we grow to become of more use to nature by becoming wiser, more creative, more courageous uh, and more loving. I think it's absolutely incredible. Uh, your brain body is here for you. Um, therefore, you should program it and conscious tell it what you want it to do. Because if you don't, society, corporations, culture, religion, the, or the media, they will. And if they've programmed it, then you are just a passenger being dragged along behind your programmed little horsey, rather than the fearless, immortal rider of that wonderful multifunction tool at whatever stage of its reconditioning you happen to find it in right now. So. 
when seen from these new perspectives, it always makes me smile when uh, pet owners treat their cats and dogs better than they treat their own meat soup. Imagine how your unconscious brain and body might feel witnessing that disparity. We are a very, very programmed species. And I think waking up to this shocking fact seems to be the prevailing zeitgeist for those who are brave enough to question everything rather than blindly just accepting everything that they're told. I think we often overlook this natural energetic intelligence within us that connects us to the macro environment of nature. And I think what stops us connecting to, this, you know, to nature is the overdeveloped attachment we have to the conscious thinking and the intellectual mind. When I was young, I used to do a lot of cross-country running. And my favorite part of the running and the racing was running through forests and over logs or running down steep and rugged hills and pathways. And I soon realized that my body, my legs and my feet could automatically hop, jump, twist and rapidly find all the right places to land. And if I stumbled, uh, they were very impressive at allowing me to sort of regain my composure and carry on traveling at very fast speed. Um, and I could do that faster than I could consciously think that I could do it. I could do it faster than I could consciously keep up with. And if I did consciously think too much, it would get in the way, either in the way of this incredible unconscious and innate ability, or it would use its logic and reason to try and talk me out of trusting these impressive um, abilities within me by giving me a whole bunch of fearful stories. Careful if you go down there, what if you fall over, what if you break your leg? Okay. <laughs> I often remembered getting to the bottom of some really dangerous hill and running really, really fast and just trusting my body and overtaking all these other people that were more cautious. And at the bottom, I would think, wow, how cool am I? <laughs> Obviously, looking back on it, I can now see that that was my ego trying to take credit for something that it wasn't even doing. Yeah. And if I did fall because something out of my brain body's control changed the computable variables of the situation, like a, a rock being loose or another person's foot tripping me, it was still amazing that the brain body still did its best in real time to analyze how I might fall and automatically put me into physical positions that might minimize any harm or shut down my memory to hide the trauma of some specific impact. Plus, if there was damage, it would automatically repair itself if it could. Now, I think this is bloody amazing. <laughs> but so few people go around saying, how lucky am I to have one of these most incredible automatic meat suits? Okay, seemingly we humans are mesmerized by the concept of identifying with our logical and reasoning conscious brains and using them to try to decide what is best for our self-regulating uh, meat soup, which will tell you what it needs if only you will listen. Instead, we say things like, well, I only eat this because I'm one of those, or this supplement will help with X, Y, Z problem, okay? Or, or this crystal will help me align with whatever that thing is. Or, or I can't buy anything from, that comes from that country because of X, Y, Z reason. All of which are conscious programs of which our multifunction meat soup really couldn't care less about and is often negatively impacted by. But my point is simple. Our body already knows what is good or bad for it unconsciously. You just sniff some milk or walk near some stinging nettles and you'll unconsciously intuit that something might be wrong without the need for your overthinking and overconditioned programmed intelligent prefrontal cortex telling you what it thinks will keep you safe or not. That part of our brain was the last part to develop evolutionarily speaking and we worked just fine before it arrived. Yes, it's good at doing calculations, but it's rubbish at knowing what our bodies truly need. No other creature on the planet washes their food, disinfects their nests, 
or can look up on the internet which plants are, which plants are poisonous. And they, they just intrinsically know, like from some nature-based energy database, that they can intuit or they expand their experiential knowledge by sampling many different things and finding out what works for them. They are just at one with nature. Not in, a, not in a saving the planet kind of way, just in an energetically connected and sampling every moment, looking for experiential data rather than thinking kind of way. And sure, your conscious brain may have influenced an idea, um, uh, a concept or a thought that the brain body then actioned or rejected, but you are not doing it. It just happens once instructed. And I think it's really cool. And I think this body and brain combination can be easily tricked. I think they can be adapted and I think that they can be reprogrammed if you know what you're doing. Even thinking, the brain just thinks. All the time it's pulling data from all of the body's senses so that it's aware of the environment around you. Okay? And it tries to unconsciously formulate its best guess as to what you might need at that moment and in the next moment. And if you are not telling the brain body what you need, which is called a conscious intention, it will default to what it thinks is best for you based on its old unconscious programming from somebody else. <laughs> the brain body analyzes your problems, then proposes solutions and emotionally or even physically yeah, guide you towards what it guesses is safe for you or away from what it guesses is dangerous. And I say guesses because your brain sits in the darkness of your skull, so how can it know for sure? <laughs> Consider this. As you watch this video, streams of photons enter your eyes after traversing the energy space between your device and your face. And they zoom down your optical nerve into the brain which automatically decodes those signals in real time, and then it constructs an image of me, which it then projects onto your mind screen at the back of your brain. And it seems like you're looking out of your eyes, but you're not, because light goes into your eyes, and what you see is on the mind screen at the back of your brain, which sits in the darkness of your skull. And only then do you, you consciously do anything with that information. But in reality, and by then, most decisions have already been made unconsciously for you. And the truth that nobody ever discusses is that we humans, we're virtually blind. Not only are we not looking out of our eyes, but all of the light and information that does enter our eyes um, comes from only a tiny sliver of the actual light spectrum. Uh, we can't see x-rays, we can't see infrared. There's so many things that we can't see um, because our primary five senses don't necessarily have the right physical ability to detect and decode all that information. And behind those overly conditioned five senses, we have further more delicate senses that are tuned in to things like energy, feelings, emotions, frequency, and maybe even other dimensions. Who knows? Another truth that is so rarely discussed is though most of your brain body is unconscious and automatic, you can consciously upgrade it. And I hope you'll want to upgrade it, A, after hearing about all this information, and B, when you can recognize that it can only be the conscious part of your brain that takes responsible for testing the quality of the data that was put into your unconscious brain during your childhood and to test it to see if it's true by pitching all that stories and all that information against real world situations. Okay? And it gets even more complicated because not only do you have your unconscious inner reality, your inner interpretation of life, which is uniquely real to you, and which we might call your inner subjective experience. But there's also another reality, a completely different outer reality, the outer objective worlds outside of us. There are two realities, an inner one and an outer one. Both are real and both are true. 
um, and though both are real, uh, they co are completely different in how they operate uh, and how you may interpret them. And though there may be many players in that external objective game of life who we might blame for our troubles, it will of course only be by us taking full responsibility for our own actions that will ultimately determine our experience, our growth, our inclusion, and our integration within that external objective world. And we need a separate plan for each reality, although ultimately it's your inner reality that will be the truth of how you will experience life, and therefore is probably where the greatest change is possible. But we weren't taught any of this in school. We were just programmed to fit in, follow the rules, respect authority, and try to be of use to the system. Plus, are you starting to consider that we are not separate from nature? We are part of nature. We are made from the same atoms of all the, as all the trees and all the animals around us, and we all swim in the same invisible electromagnetic field of energy that holds all our atoms together into a clump called our body. And all the invisible energy between us stops us all squishing into, into one big blob. And is your perspective on life widening enough to see that energy contains information? Thoughts are energy forms, and they may be low energy and life negating, or they may be high energy and life enhancing. Uh, saying or hearing, um, I hate you, is a very different energy from saying or hearing, I love you. And things like Wi-Fi, um, radio waves, cell phone waves, TV signals, all carry information invisibly through this energy field all around us, looking for a receiver which it can tune into, okay? Uh, it can find the right frequency, it can de decode all that information and then utilize that knowledge and that energy. Can you see how potentially everything changes as you climb out of the content of an issue, okay, and look at it from a, a different context. Now, if we go back to the brain's corrupt data, I think it's useful to explore both where much of that data came from and what is the potential accuracy or truth of that information and that knowledge. Um, when I reflect on questions like this, I can't help but feel that most of the data our brain is using to base all its calculations upon is largely untested by us. Um, it might be true, but it might not be true, even if it feels true. Um, think about it. The vast uh, majority of the data in your brain came from very structured rules, regulations, and beliefs, ranging from information from your parents, from schools, culture, uh, religion, friends, universities, radio, television, music, comics, social media, books, science um, and films, and a thousand other sources. Now all that data your brain absorbed may have been true, but it may also have been a distortion of the truth, or that input may have been a downright lie. And then as we grew up, I think it's interesting to ponder what internal organic algorithm did the brain inside your head in the darkness of your inner reality develop to use to be able to discern what was true and what might be false without physically testing it. Uh, was what you were taught to be true somebody else's truth or a lie that somebody else might have wished you would believe uh, was true um, so that you you believe in that may have uh, benefited them in some manner. I hope I'm explaining this well enough. Conversely, some lesser volume of your brain's data was constructed from your real-world interactions where you did something real, you got a measurable result, so you had a subjective experience of that objective happening, therefore what you found out was true experientially to you, so you could have more faith in the quality of the knowledge of your brain. 
data which we have learned but never tested, which came from sources the brain was initially conditioned to trust, like um, universities, governments, doctors and scientists, tend to form the brain's belief systems, which it will then use to make unconscious decisions on our behalf. And once the brain adopts a belief, it often automatically fights to defend or uphold that belief, even in the face of opposing information that feels real, especially if it comes from a source currently less respected or trusted by the brain. And I hope you can see that that might make sense, especially after all the experiences we've been through in the last few years. So if any organization is trying to get money from you or wants you to behave in certain ways, by default, it may be prudent to question or to test that data before just blindly accepting it. And I think this is just common sense advice to protect ourselves against the less favorable aspects of human nature. And let's be realistic, okay? There's good people out there and there's bad people out there. There's people out there that are very caring and there's people out there that are caring but do whatever they need to do to get what they need to happen. Therefore, it seems common sense to me to spend time testing our existing beliefs to see if they're trustworthy and then through continuous real world exposure, can we gain additional experiential data so that we can have more faith in our knowledge as we begin to grow and as we begin to change. <laughs> I'll give you an example. When I made my first animation video uh, about anxiety, it was in 2016. And I only did it for fun to see if I could do it. Uh, and it took me three weeks to make a 17 minute animation about complex anxiety. And when it was finished, I showed it to one of my friends by simply saying to him, what do you think of this? And I was expecting them to say how crappy my animation was and that there was spelling mistakes in there and how wacky my description of anxiety is and how awful my voice was and how different it was from what the doctors were normally saying about um, anxiety. And bless him, my friend, he watched it all the way through and he said, oh my God, how much did that cost for you to get a whole animation made by a professional marketing company? He said, it's brilliant. I love the animations, it's so understandable. And your voice is great. And your message makes complete sense. I've never heard anything like that before. What response did you get when you put it on YouTube? <laughs> and I said, well, it was me who made it and it didn't cost me any money. Um, and I only did it for fun so I could learn how to do it. And that I personally thought that it was rubbish, okay? And he said, no, no, it's brilliant. You've, you've got to upload it, upload it today. And I said something like, well, the quality is too bad and I don't want my work being scrutinized by the world because I'm not a doctor. So I shouldn't really be giving advice outside my role as, a, as an engineer masquerading as a therapist. And, uh, and my ego gave him five other reasons why I shouldn't uh, post it based on my fears of being judged or rejected or ridiculed or whatever stories my ego had back in 2016. And he said to me, those are all stories in your head, John. You won't know the real truth until you take a real world action to see what really happens and then you'll have some real world data. So let's upload it. So I did, I felt vulnerable yet I still took action and it was received almost immediately unbelievably well. It's now had over a million views and it's got a 98.2 thumbs up rating and hundreds of people telling me how that information changed their lives and asking me to make more videos. My brain was wrong with the subjective data it used to form its prior beliefs. But because those beliefs had never been real world tested, I had just assumed that they were true. But after they were tested and then I had real world facts to work with, my brain could update those old beliefs with new objective truths. People did like my work. Uh, I was talented and I could make myself vulnerable and the world didn't end. In, in fact, it was that video which convinced me to start making this course in 2019. And creating this course has changed me and it's changed my life 
in so many positive ways that my brain could never ever have imagined. Writing, editing and publishing what I believe to be true, even if others didn't believe me, and continually testing uh, and challenging my old brain stories rather than just accepting them became my new game of life. I decided what I wanted from life and I began walking towards it. If I needed something, I would ask for it. If I didn't want to do something, I would say no. I became belligerently honest with myself and everybody around me and I started living my life, not the life that others wanted for me or the life that my old stories were telling me I ought to live up to. So that what I'm saying here is kind of complex. It's also quite simple, especially if you can reorientate your observer awareness from my, fo focusing all the micro details of your inner fears and what makes you anxious into the outer macro view of who do you wish to become and what do you wish to do with your life. As I said in video 44, people who act, then think, then adjust, then act again, will always outperform those who think but don't act, or those who think that only once they understand something fully can they possibly begin to move forward. This is just another of those common sense facts of life anxious people struggle to grasp as they are so identified with and addicted to their thoughts rather than their potential greatness, which will never be revealed unless they're doing real world actions with real life people uh, rather than distracting themselves with drama, YouTube or other people's issues rather than finding their own solutions. Okay, <laughs> so let's kind of regroup and, uh, uh, and, and get back to sensible, positive li uh, life ERP routines. So we look for ways where we become forced to find real world experiential data feedback by exposing ourselves to what the brain and body fear and then preventing ourselves from taking our current avoidant distraction responses to see what will truly happen over and above us just having a noisy brain and a scared body and remaining stuck. If you do these things, you'll be answering the question, did you actually catch that disease? Did you actually harm that person? Yeah. Did that bin actually infect you? Did that family member actually get ill? Did you enjoy kissing that person? Were you actually arrested? Are you gay? Yeah. Was the date more fun than you expected? Uh, did you actually get fired? Uh, did you actually crash your car? Did that animal bite you? Did you get offered the job? <laughs> when you test these stories out, did your worst fears happen? Or what truly did happen when you exposed yourself to those fears and you prevented your old responses from stopping you from taking action, regardless of the brain's thoughts and the body's feelings. This is what normal people have to do each and every day. And what I discovered was life became a lot more engaging. It became a, a lot more exciting as I became part of it rather than trying to control or avoid it. And here's another thing that I really hope that you can understand. There is very little sense in doing exposure therapy on your presenting anxious symptoms, okay, unless they're in the context of expanding your life, because complex anxiety will just move from one symptom to another symptom, and you'll think that unless you can find the, 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 fix the symptom, you can't get on with your life, but it will just keep moving from one to the other to the other, and you will remain stuck. OCD and anxiety try to keep you away from life. But on the other hand, if you apply ERP to your life, it forces you to face those symptoms, but in the real world. Therefore, you are learning new skills, meeting more people, and you're expanding your life. You could be scared by doing ERP on your symptoms, or scared by doing ERP on your life, 
However, this second way is faster as you develop more skills and you stir up life a bit, thus giving you far more opportunities. And I'm recommending that you rip off the sticking plaster as fast as possible. Stop using your dominance, creativity and anger to harm yourself. Instead, learn how to challenge, challenge them and channel them. Use them as a source of energy, leading you to a more authentic life that aligns you with what you do want, rather than focusing on what you don't want. Now, as you rip off that old plaster by engaging with life, by exposing your old cover stories, and by looking beneath your brain's conditions and beliefs to finally face your fears, there's one more thing that you need to know. It's my experience that 15 to 20% of the Western world's population have some form of complex anxiety. And one of their biggest yet silent frustrations are how slowly and how robotically the other 80% of the people function. Why do other people think so slowly? Why aren't they spontaneous? Why can't they see the obvious? Uh, why does it take them so long to make decisions? Why do they crumble in a true emergency? And why do they deviate from sensible plans and guidelines that would put in place to improve efficiency? And I think this is a big problem. Because if this sounds a bit like you, it will be very hard for you to delegate work to others or be told what to do, as you'd probably be able to do those tasks faster and better than most of the people around you. Or perhaps you do have these superpowers, but because they were suppressed or manipulated during your childhood, you unknowingly repressed all your dominance uh, and you repressed all your creativity. And now you rigidly follow all the rules to the last letter so that nobody can judge you or criticize you. It's almost like saying you're cutting off your own nose to spite your face, but that anger and that frustration, they have to go somewhere and they often get pushed down and energetically trapped within your body. Or to use my metaphor, repressed down into the atomic battery of condensed potential energy just waiting to be released, but until it is released, causes inflammation, pain, and that sort of background feeling of fear that you can't quite put your finger on. Whilst at the same time, it's depleting your biological battery with you holding all that energy down and thinking that you have to analyze all your thoughts and worry about everything as you try to figure everything out. Uh, it's exhausting. I mean, you know the story. I've said it a hundred times. But so often, what people with complex anxiety fail to grasp is that beneath all their childhood conditioning, they themselves are the gifted ones, the potential leaders the rebels, the, the fabric of society, the, the imaginative creators who had that innate aspect of their personality squashed down so they could fit in to the slow and boring life of this other 80% of the population who are just sheepishly doing what they're told or doing what they think is expected from them. Ask yourself, are you using your gift of having an advanced complex personality, okay, and a very, very fast brain and obsessive tendencies to define and live your life or to trap you and keep you stuck. Most complexly anxious people are actually very useful in an emergency. They respond quickly and logically while others flap around. And in those moments, uh, they don't have time to think, so they just respond automatically or with common sense. And normally and usually, they do a really good job. <laughs> think about it, okay? In an emergency, when there isn't time to think, they do really well. But when there's no emergency, they do all the if only worrying about the past and all the what if worrying about the future, and they exhaust themselves with doubt and worry. As I've said before, there is a sense of calmness that can be found within us, even when our bodies are feeling nervous. And this is something that um, soldiers, um, bomb disposal specialists, surgeons, athletes, nurses, mountain climbers, racing drivers, and anybody who rides a motorbike, they know for sure. Although the, their bodies may be experiencing fear or excitement, they can still, to a certain degree, maintain 
a sense of stillness, composure, self-trust, and intense focus on what they wish to do, which allows them to proceed with their intentions and ignore the brain's fearful thoughts or the body's corresponding emotions. And very often, they have an anxiety attack after the emergency, <laughs> because during the event, they were so laser fo focused on their task in hand that they didn't have time to scare themselves with all the things that, that could go wrong, so they do it to themselves afterwards. Now, I find this both ironic and sadly distressing because it's so unnecessary. That behavior is only the result of their conditioned brain and body doing what it was programmed to do in early life. We are simply and unconsciously being run by the programs that we were programmed with. So to reprogram these programs, you have to be willing to put in the effort to endure temporary discomfort and to tolerate the repetition of a new, more positive, optimistic and intentions-based I story and according behaviors. But most importantly, you'll have to learn how to consciously and willingly suspend many of your brain's existing beliefs, which you think are yours, long enough to explore new knowledge, new values, and new beliefs, and new perspectives that your conditioned brain were trained to reject in childhood because they were not scientific and because they were not provable. Yet many work really efficiently, which of course is what this course is about, is teaching you what they all are. I guess the most um, obvious and simplistic example I can think of about a belief system is a person with type 2 diabetes unconsciously having a we must eat five fruit and veg a day a belief system running in their brain when eating carbs and sugars are the very core of their largely reversible metabolic dysfunction. As I keep saying, common sense is now so uncommon that when it's seen, it's almost so unbelievable that our belief system dismisses it, even though our intuition is screaming at us to listen because it knows something's wrong here, but it can hear something might be wrong right out there. So many of our great teachers, they say the same thing. They say, actually, life is really funny. They say, uh, life is a big game, okay? And the world needs to be all messed up. Otherwise, how would we have these challenges and how can we learn anything? They say, once you wake up and can see how things really work in that outer world, as opposed to how you were taught they work. And once you can acknowledge that though your animal body and its brain will die, you can't die because you are the energy of conscious awareness and energy can't be destroyed. It lives forever um, and that energy holds information. And the great teachers, they say, once you can see all this, or certainly if you can program it into your unconscious brain, life becomes reasonably easy. And at that point, it's quite sad, but also funny to watch those who haven't figured it out yet because they exhaust themselves clinging to stories, which are the very things that are stopping them from having a calmer, healthier, and a richer life. And they say, there's nothing you can do to help them, okay, um, because they don't listen, okay, because they are so deeply ingrained in what they believe is right, and they rigidly cling to those old values and those old beliefs and the, their old stories as though that they were theirs, even though that's what was programmed into them from parents, school, culture, religion, TV, social media, corporations and governments. Think about it. Why do you have to be good? Um, why do you have to save the planet? Why do you have to follow rules? Yeah? Why do you have to do as you're told? Uh, why should you play it safe? Uh, why should you work hard? Why do you have to work at all? You know, why should you pay taxes? I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do these things. I'm saying these are the questions that you can ask yourself. Surely as an adult, you can now choose who you wish to become and what you desire to do and then program that into your brain that wasn't able to do it for itself when it was young. So you had to accept somebody else's dream 
until you're old enough and wise enough to choose the dream you want and then to program it in to your little brain body meat suit. <laughs> and it gets even easier, okay, if you can see things differently. Sometimes um, if people experience a sort of a, a dissociation or a um, derealization uh, or a disassoci disassociation from themselves, they might feel a bit scared, scared or out of control, like if they took some drugs or if they were, were drunk. Yeah? And they might hate that feeling of being out of control of the, of the body. A huge lesson I learned many years ago is that you never were in control. <laughs> the observer is not controlling the body. The body runs itself. But anxious people think that they, that they are doing it and that they should be able to control everything um, um, when they can't. Okay? But it is possible to learn to let go and to just trust it. And you can feel detached and you can feel separate. But what you'll find is it still functions without you. Um, like those soldiers and those surgeons and the motorbike riders I, I mentioned earlier, they are trusting their bodies to do what is needed as they keep their conscious awareness on what intentions they have for that moment and they just ignore everything else. And practicing how to detach from the body and brain and to just trust them, I think is a powerful process to learn uh, because, you know, you can't control life but you can accept it and you can influence it, but whatever outcomes come, or whatever outcomes come. And I think this is what meditation helps you to do, is to sort of watch the brain and watch the body and just be with it, let it do whatever it needs to do. And it's my experience after a certain period of time, and once we've retrained our body, and once we've removed any trapped trauma, we might choose to reorientate, reorientate ourselves back into the, the body, or we may seem to sort of enjoy being on the periphery of it. Um, personally, I try to dance with all aspects of my whole self, jumping from moment to moment to whatever aspect of me is appropriate for the situation I find myself in, the outcomes I'm looking for, or the resources that I have available to me in that moment. I have used ERP to physically desensitize my body yeah? And I use iStory ERP to condition my brain to operate differently from that with which it was wired up when I was a child. Um, let me try and give you some examples. In each moment, I separate the emotions of the body from the stories of the brain. And then I ignore those brain stories because I didn't ask for them. And I do that by placing my conscious awareness, what is happening externally in the environment around me, and what my intention for that particular moment is. Uh, will I bring out my warrior and take control? Will I bring out my settler and fit in? Will I bring out my nomad and be all playful? Uh, will I be introverted? Will I be extroverted? <laughs> extroverted? Will my actions be for my benefit or to benefit somebody else? Um, in that moment, should I be focusing on the content, the context, or the perspective of the situation? that presents itself in that moment? Are the people around me getting triggered? Um, can I not take that personally? Uh, might I need to switch to a different strategy halfway through my first strategy because the first one isn't working? Yeah. Um, do I want to listen to people's problems or in that moment do I wish to help them solve them? Uh, do I have enough energy to help others or do I want to keep my energy at the moment for myself? Which character is chatting in my brain? Is it the victim, the pleaser, the rebel, the princess, or whatever it is? And is that a character I desire to listen to, or shall I just ignore it? Is my body getting emotionally triggered with anger, frustration, fear, passion, or, or desire? And do I wish, wish to increase that feeling because it's pleasurable? Or if that feeling is uncomfortable, will I just ignore it? Or will I trick my central nervous system back to a reset position? Or might I just allow that uncomfortable emotion to flow through me and out of me without allowing my brain to attach a story to it? Or might I listen to that emotion or that intuition and remove myself from that situation or change it or accept it? This is the type of emotional self-mastery I'm inviting you to learn how to develop within yourself um, 
And I know it's possible because I've done it. But we don't get taught this in school. And normally our parents don't know how to do it either. Okay? I can't always do this because I'm only the rider of my horse and not the horse itself. But I seem to have become very accomplished at influencing the body and the brain towards my intentions, not theirs. Plus, I really look after my brain and body. <laughs> I, I really love them, okay? But I'm not too interested in their silly animal thoughts, their feelings, or their cravings. You might say I am lovingly unattached. I'm going to lose them one day, um, as I will everything and everybody. But I'm never going to lose me, the formless energy of my conscious awareness. So this step is really learning to detach from focusing on what is happening inside you and orientate your detached formless awareness to the external world with a new optimistic story and trust in your body to just do its best, whatever that will be. And remember, those unconscious and unrequested thoughts that scare you Okay, they do scare you because your unconscious anxiety knows what you consciously fear, okay, the most. And it just uses it against you to try to grab your attention. Think about it, okay? Unless you were a good parent, thoughts of harming your child wouldn't grab your attention. <laughs> As I mentioned in my last video, health anxiety tends to hit those with a repressed warrior. And contamination anxiety tends to hit those with a repressed nomad. The person is hit with the opposite problem of who they truly are deep down beneath all that early life conditioning. The warrior should be making decisions rather than asking for reassurance. And the nomad should be off traveling, having adventures and hanging out with lots of people rather than worrying about becoming contaminated. Anxiety is really, really predictable. And this is why it's so essential to define the intentions you wish for your life. Um, these come from the, uh, the work you applied by completing the video 32 part two workbook and moving towards those intentions. Moving towards those intentions should become your decision making framework in any moment, not your thoughts or your feelings. And remember, how can you reprogram your reticular activating system, your RAS, which I talked about in video 18, if you haven't decided what you want from life or who you wish to be? Without you changing it, it will remain conditioned by all your current fears, thus looking for them and presenting evidence of them to you all day long. And that's scary. <laughs> and finally, in this section, I would briefly like to discuss high performing people who though they have complex anxiety still manage to get on with life though they are constantly being emotionally triggered these people do real world ERP but their anxiety still remains and I would like to suggest that those individuals have intensely repressed trauma or deeply trapped energy which needs to be released from their atomic battery as I talked about in video nine. And in part five of this ERP um, series of videos, I will teach you what I know about understanding, finding, and releasing these known or hidden trap traumas and emotional blockages. So please just hang on for two more videos and we're gonna get around to that. Okay, the next step is to ensure that you're not falling into one of the biggest ERP error traps that conventional CBT erroneously teaches. And that is this. Please do not use stories in your mind or scripts that you read to yourself to try to make not normal thoughts normal. And let me try and give you some examples. Um, if you have intrusive thoughts about harming a person or sexually abusing that person, do not imagine yourself doing these things and pretending that you're okay with the corresponding emotions. If you are scared of dogs, then yes, 
imagine yourself stroking a dog because that is natural and appropriate. If you feel contaminated, yes, imagine trust in your natural immunity, as I talked about in video 49. If you fear conflict, then yes, imagine yourself talking calmly to another person, standing your ground and saying what you need to say. This is the right way to reprogram your brain. But with violent, abusive, harmful, suicidal or sexual thoughts, you must run the thoughts that would be the appropriate solution in your future. Do not ingrain and do negative ERP on those ugly behaviors. You must run new positive and reality-based I stories. So for example, if you can't go near knives as you think you might hurt a person, you imagine using a knife to lovingly cook that person a meal. And then you eat it together, and then you do the washing up together, and then you put the knives and forks away together. And then after imagining those over and over again with the solution that you're looking for, then you start to begin to do those things in real life with those people around you. This is really, really important. Anxiety uses what you won't do to scare you. And once you can see this, it becomes a little funnier because you never did those things and you never will do those things. In all the years that I've been doing this, working with the most complicated uh, uh, forms of anxiety, nobody has ever acted on any of the things that their OCD is asking them to act on. Right? So, if your unrequested thoughts are about sexually abusing another, you run thoughts about dancing with them, uh, playing sports with them, okay? uh, walking through the park with them, or whatever positive interaction would be appropriate. And if your thoughts have a suicidal tendency, then you run new stories, conscious stories, about all the positive events you could wish for your life, regardless of the, their truth in that moment. And regardless of whether you believe it in that moment, we've got to put a new story in. Can you see what I'm pointing to? Because this is really, really, really important. You have never done those things, and you never will do them, because they are the opposite of who you truly are, which is why your exhausted unconscious brain is using them purely to get your attention. Realize that you have become consciously addicted to analyzing the unconscious and the unrequested thoughts of the brain. ERP is to detach from engaging with that thought by consciously focusing on what you should be doing in that moment to live a richer life and to begin to run three or four conscious, positive, trusting and optimistic stories to begin the repetitive process of bombarding your unconscious brain with I stories, the new narrative of what you are looking for moving forward. I'm a kind and loving person. I love the fact that I've never harmed anybody. I respect the fact that though I have animal urges, as everybody does, I've never acted upon them. I can see my brain is using who I am not to scare me with, but that's not who I am, so I can ignore it. <laughs> I love the fact that I have a creative brain, uh, a creative thought proposal device in my head. However, from this point onwards, I choose only to consciously accept the positive and optimistic thoughts that it pro proposes to me from its old conditioning. Can you see what a different conscious internal dialogue this is? Your unconscious automated stories will only change by you overwriting them, okay, consciously with a better story in line with your intentions over and over again, even if you don't currently believe them. <laughs> it, it pains me to keep repeating this, but it's just how it works. It's ridiculously simple but nobody ever taught you this. Some people, they um, unknowingly turn their lives into a never-ending soap opera inside their heads, which distracts them from real-life opportunities. I would say the do door to their perceived cage is wide open, but they just can't see it. And in the last final part of this video, um, because I'm asking you to ignore your emotions for a while, let me remind you um, of some of the basics. 
we start by relabeling emotions from anxiety to agitation. Remember, if you were doing something exciting, you'd want to feel some agitation. Anxiety is just excitement with a bad story, and excitement is just anxiety with a good story. And calmness is either having no story and having no feelings, or learning to consciously ignore both the thoughts and of the brain and the responses of the body. The rider can still be calm, even if the horse isn't. <laughs> so let's briefly jump back to Emotions 101. An emotion is the physical result of the biological agitation of your body from the release of stress hormones into your bloodstream, which agitates your body, as I detailed in video 11. The more chemicals released, the more they will agitate the body until it reaches a degree of overwhelm where the prefrontal cortex is turned off. And at that moment, logic and reason are disengaged back to the limbic brain, which simply puts you into flight, freeze, or escape mode. Okay, it's done automatically by the limbic part of the brain when the prefrontal bit gets turned off through being overwhelmed. And once a person calms down, meaning the chemicals have worn off, that intelligent thinking brain comes back online again, and the person either smiles at that natural sequence of events, oh yeah, that's just what happened, yeah, or they freak themselves out, okay, with it back into anxiety because they erroneously believe that they should be able to control their thoughts and feelings at all times, which you can't. We're emotional creatures who learned how to think, not thinking creatures who try to control our emotions. So when we apply ERP to emotions, we have to remember we are exposing ourselves to life and preventing our responses from stopping us. <laughs> We're not necessarily trying to stop the responses. We're not necessarily trying to stop the thoughts or the feelings. We are learning to inhibit our responses from stopping us from taking action towards our intentions for a richer, more compelling life. Therefore, if we apply some common sense perspectives on how you might intelligently desensitize your body, your automatic meat soup, um, here are a few tips. The absolute fastest way to overcome anxious sensations in your body is to take the very action that will better your life. You drive, you date, you apply for a job, you leave home. You fly, you stop cleaning, you start saying no, or you start saying yes, you make friends, you do all the positive actions for a richer life that I've been talking about. And as you do these things, you ignore those fearful emotions as they arise, as they are just fear chemicals being released into your bloodstream that agitate your body. And to be honest with you, so what? You, you can let them go, you haven't got to focus on them, okay? Right? You can learn to not care about that feeling. And if you can, it's no longer a problem. Accept them and give them no meaning. Or if that's too overwhelming in the beginning, okay, um, you can immediately use tricks to desensitize the body from releasing those fear chemicals or tricks to emotionally recover from their release. Okay, and other trips to trick other tips to stop the release of any more coming through into your body from excess worry. Do you remember back in uh, video 41 where I mentioned the first time I took the recreational drug um, ecstasy or MDMA? The amphetamine, the speed in that drug, gave me what I would have classified as a panic attack. Um, my heart was, was racing, my, heart, my palms got sweaty, I was shaking, my, my vision got blurred and my mouth was dry and I felt really out of control. Yes, of course my body was doing those things because I had ingested that amphetamine into my bloodstream which had agitated my body and my body was, was having the appropriate response to what I had done to it. Then 20 minutes later, my body accessed its own serotonin and I had this beautiful, wonderful feeling that came over me and I could ignore all those underlying bodily <laughs> agitations because this new sensation felt so lovely. 
And then the second time I took it, when the initial amphetamine agitation came on, as much as I didn't like it, I could just accept it and go, oh yeah, this is just the agitation phase. I can ignore this, I can just sit through it. I can even do something else until the next phase kicks in. Now, it's the same with our natural fear or our anxiety responses. Adrenaline and cortisone have been appropriately or inappropriately released within you uh, by your old programs, which are not you. They're just the old erroneous programs running within you. And of course, the body will intrinsically become agitated by those natural chemicals and you can accept and ignore these sensations until such a time that you have spent the time and effort to desensitize yourself and got around to reprogramming your amygdala to remove those erroneous fearful associations to life, people, events, germs, or, or whatever your thing is from its unsafe database to the safe database. Just like I taught you way back in video eight, which you probably haven't been doing. It's more likely that you've been unknowingly reinforcing all those errors, all those stories via negative ERP, meaning running the same old fearful stories. I'm sorry if I'm a bit of a broken record here, but this is what you need to do. You, the observer, immortal, timeless, conscious awareness, are riding the body, which has a brain. And that brain, though incredible, is also fallible and trickable and wasn't designed for the way that we live these days. However, it is very possible to make some aftermarket adjustments which might favor this modern, though absurd and artificial environment in which we currently find ourselves. That brain constantly and automatically and at the speed of light is processing all sensory data inputs, light, sound, touch, taste, smell, energy, vibration, frequency, balance, distance, times, rules, reproduction, digestion, breathing, cell division, and 10 million other things, okay? It then makes, at the speed of light, decisions, okay? And applies them to body, which automatically responds to all of that information and gives you direction. And this is why we respond so well in emergency situation. The brain has been evaluating, okay? all the things that are real in that moment, then firing off what it thinks is the best response after doing a million unconscious calculations in real time to what it thinks is happening from within its blind and dark inner cave, guessing about what's out there right? and trying to keep you alive based upon all its prior programming. And this is why I could run down the hill without thinking. And this is why the motorbiker racer could race without thinking. And the bomb disposal guy can follow all those processes without thinking because they are not doing it. The brain and body just do it automatically if we can learn how to trust them and just get out of their way. But for some people, this may mean they have to undo the erroneous programs they received growing up and to install a new operating system then run it in through repetition, trying new things, um, seeing what will happen, then making adjustments in line with their intentions, then seeing what will happen, make adjustments, and, and so it goes on, so it goes, this is how you engage with life. And this is the process of living an active and self-responsible life that nobody told you was the right thing to do, and nobody likely told you how to do it. Gosh. <laughs> so in summary, don't see ERP as a technique you apply to anxiety. It's the process of training your little meat suit to align with your intentions, regardless of how it childishly kicks and screams and tries to sabotage you with virtual reality, untested, worst case scenarios. That silly game needs to end. We're not children anymore. We're becoming responsible adults. And what we can truly handle and what we can truly achieve and what we can truly grow into, I think is incredible. So the story I've programmed into my auto meat suit, my horsey, <laughs> is I would rather die young, pushing the boundaries of my capabilities by sampling everything and living an experientially rich life, which will develop my purpose my courageousness, my emotional dexterity, and certainly will expand my skills. And by doing so, will increase my value to nature or, or divinity, 
so she will want to give me more energy, more opportunities, and more access to higher conscious states of awareness. And I would rather do that than live a very long life, avoiding danger, yet still feeling scared, whilst feeling unfulfilled and without a purpose, and unable to handle the opportunities that nature potentially might have for me. And quite frankly, consciously, I don't care if that story is true, though I do believe that it is true, all I need to do is to trick my unconscious brain into believing it. And when I did, everything changed for the better. We don't apply ERP to anxiety. We consciously apply it to our meat suit all day, every day, because it's just a lovely programmable little pet which will serve you well if you get it what it needs and if you program it with your intentions for this life of learning, discovery and love. So, <laughs> in my next video, uh, it will be totally dedicated to the words and the tricks you use to calm yourself down and to take the steps towards your actions and antidote all of the sabotage that goes on within yourself so that we can calm down and we can train our adorable little automaton uh, into a happy, healthy and useful mechanism that we can use to become our best selves. And remember, it's not what our meat suit looks like or what shape it is. What's important is which part of us is influencing him and loving him and guiding him, um, accepting him and giving him a new dialogue, okay? Um, and taking him towards um, the best he can be. And that is your conscious awareness. And I think that is nature learning to be its best self. Okay, so you get working on applying ERP to your life, and I'll put that video together, and you'll have it next month. <laughs> Thanks a lot.